Welcome to the Jenkins User Experience Special Interest Group. It's the 22nd of June, 2022, and delighted to have everyone here. Thanks very much. Agenda topics that I've got include June LTS, code coverage improvements prevented, presented by Uli, further discussion on an accessibility assessment, and actually, I'd like to move that one down because I think that's much less valuable than the next one on the list. Vodex commentary on uh, some specific pull, a specific pull request, and then a security review of UI-related PRs. And I've got this accessibility assessment. And if Jan joins us on time, we'll look to discuss further UI improvements. Any other topics that need to be on our agenda today? Okay, so top item, the June LTS just released. So 2.346.1 released with security fixes, uh, UI improvements, uh, other improvements to core. Uh, there were also a number of, there was a, a corresponding 332.4 uh, release with security fixes in case users of the previous LTS baseline aren't ready to accept the UI improvements, they can they could deploy this security fixes. Also 2.356 weekly release includes the security fixes. Uh, thanks to Kevin Martins for the, the change log and the upgrade guide. And thanks to Basil Crow as well for his contributions there. There are a number of changes in packaging, in other things like the Alpine Docker image, for instance, no longer includes glibc. It's really shrunk to be what closer to what you expect an Alpine image to be. Those kinds of, of improvements, really positive. Any questions on June LTS? One thing, um, now we have a point four release. Uh, this means that we had we said it will not happen so far again because we have the problem with the baselines for the plugins. What would be the next baseline for the plugins? Should we use the 0.4 release as baseline for plugins as dependencies? I think this will be a little bit, hopefully, our script will uh, follow this new uh, release. As far as as far as I know, it does follow it. So, okay, so fine. when we're when so what Uli is referring to is when setting the minimum Jenkins version that is required by a plugin, our general guidance is please use the tail end of a preceding LTS. So the basically the end point of a preceding LTS release. Usually that's a dot three. 2.319.3, 2.303.3, but 2.332, like a number of preceding ones, had one additional release in it. And so when choosing a minimum Jenkins version, use the final release of that LTS line. And so in this case, it would be dot four. Good question, Uli. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And as far and, and so let me put myself in action item mark to check that the the version page has been updated. Uh, and just in case the dot three is not the only thing that we are getting in general, the dot four is something exceptional, but we also got even a dot six at some point. So right, right. Don't so worry, dot three is not the last one. That's the main message. Right. And thankfully, we haven't, the mistakes that caused us to do the dot six all that time ago were mostly Mark Waite's fault. And so Mark stopped making that particular class of mistake. He makes other mistakes now. Yeah, exactly. Great. All right. Anything else on June LTS? Okay, next topic then, code coverage improvements. Uli, um, you okay if I have you share your screen? I can't hear you, Uli. Sorry, I didn't find the button. <laughs> now I find it. And I think it would make sense. Um, is it okay in this way? Do you see the screen or, and me or is it? 
Yeah, that's that's great. I just need to change to speaker view so I can see you full size. Yeah, great. I think it's a little bit easier for me when I see it here and me on the same page. So um, yeah, the, uh, maybe just to um, give a summary of the work we had uh, in the previous uh, session of our UI or UI SIG meeting about the code coverage plugin. Um, a student of uh, in our university started to uh, refactor the code and add a new feature that we can only not only show the total coverage of a project report, but we now can also see uh, a delta report of a change request. That means if someone is changing only three files or so, we can now look at the coverage of the of these three files only and visualize the results which are actually interesting so i don't want to see for a pull request how the code coverage of the whole project changes it's more important i think to see the actual code coverage the yeah, committer has in this pull request so this was the, basically the background of the work we added in the code coverage plugin and to uh, facilitate this uh, new feature we needed to grab information from Git. So we are using the Git forensics plugin to look at a pull request, which changes we had, which files have been modified, and we merged these changes with the coverage information. So we have a mapping of changed files and yeah, code coverage that actually changed. So this is the background and um, let's see it on the screen. And what we now have is uh, a new code coverage report. So or maybe I start uh, here on this build side. So we have typically a code coverage report was shown by a trend chart. And this is the old chart. This is not changed yet. We have a trend chart where we see the how the code coverage of the whole project changes from build to build. So we see the line coverage, the branch coverage, and yeah, it's yeah, not much here in this project, but typically you have some ups and downs where you see where the project changes. Now, what we have added uh, to the build report is we have the code coverage report for each build. And what I've highlighted now is the, the previous information that we see the project coverage in one project. And typically the, it, it does not change very much from from commit to commit, because if you have a lot of files uh, here in this example, I have a code coverage of 90% and the next commit will not change it to 20%. This is not possible. So what we now have added is um, this but thing here in the bottom, we have a change coverage where we can look at the files that have been changed. Here we have exactly 14 lines that have been changed in one file. And in these 14 lines, we have now a code coverage of 70% uh, and a branch coverage of 100%. So now we have a better measurement of pull requests. We see how good a pull request uh, is actually for this code coverage. So this is one information and let's look at uh, a previous build. So we see how it uh, behaves from build to build. For instance, here we have what I, as in my, my test instance, I basically built all my releases of the analysis model plugin. So I started with release eight, then release nine, release 10 and so on. And every release I created this Delta coverage and compared the Delta coverage to the results of the previous release. And and if we look here, we see again, okay, the code coverage actually did not change much, only by 0.05, uh, it's almost nothing. But here we see, okay, the change coverage is perfect. We have a line coverage of 100% and a branch coverage of 100% as well. And we have nine lines changed and three files affect. So this is a new overview where we have where we now better see the results for pull requests, for instance. It, this computation is not only available for pull requests, it's also available if you're just building one build on the master branch and the next build on the master branch. 
then you can also compare the differences from build to build as well. So this depends on the reference build we are you are using. This is the same thing I'm using in the warnings plugin. So let's see. If, mm, yep. okay. And is there is there source code visualization or Uli, are you okay with questions or would you like to continue yes, before course, questions? Please, please. So so the change coverage report is there a way for me to see at the statement level which statements were missed in the change coverage is the coverage is there a way for me to look at that at the at the source code level? So let's uh, look at the uh, report. Oh, this was ah, the wrong button, sorry. <laughs> I clicked on the wrong screen. So uh, this is the new uh, report, um, the details report, and the details report has been uh, rearranged. Um, I'm now using some tabs uh, because there is a lot of additional information I needed to place somewhere. So I'm um, starting, we have some overview, which is the same as in the previous release. But what we now have, we have a tab for the file coverage. This is uh, the code coverage of all files of the project. This is similar as we had before. The only thing is that we that we changed the visualization that we have now these, uh, yeah, you can sort and you see the different um, batches how and see how good your code coverage is and if you look at the change coverage and this is the more most important thing i mean then you can see um, when you look here you see the change coverage and in the change coverage you see um actually only three files and these are the, these three files have been changed and you can now look at the individual lines of these uh, changes and see how it behaves. So let's see. I think uh, I need to make the screen a little bit smaller. The problem is um, what we have. Uh, we have. Let's start. Uh, I need to redrive. Sorry, one moment. Okay, because. Um, one problem is where do we show the source code? One thing is we can show the source code by clicking into the link and following it. Then we have the source code here. Uh, and this currently is the whole source code where you see uh, yeah, here is everything is green. That means here we have 100% line coverage. What we also have implemented, but this is only visible on large screens. Um, that we have a, a, a side by side visualization of this table and the source code and when you click in the table you see the source code but uh, i think it's because of uh, zoom change uh, let's see if i can make it a little bit I, i'm not sure if it will work let me uh, see if it i make the screen a little bit bigger but i think it will not work uh, now we have it okay normally on a real screen it looks a little bit better than in zoom yet now but uh, what we also have is that we we can click here and then you see on the right as a source code this does not work on a laptop it's just you need a good monitor but then you see only the change what actually so you see it's just one line that has been modified and this is, um, yeah, I think a more interesting view for pull requests that you are not interested in everything was what is already here. You will see only the changes which we have in this pull request. And now we have this information, we grab it from Git and combine it with the code coverage information from Kubatura or from Chacoco. So, and is this already released and delivery, or are you showing us a prototype? This looks uh, this looks really beautiful. Um, yeah, I wanted to release it uh, this weekend because I need some time for <laughs> potential bug reports. So, <laughs> yeah, it's basically it's ready to be released now. And um, I thought to release it today in the morning, but then I thought yeah, I have no time to fix any bugs that may occur, so I thought it's better to release it on the weekend, where I have some more time to fix some things which might not work in all instances, so 
Well, and and but if the security team doesn't thank you for not releasing it today, I thank you for not releasing it today. Okay. As a Jenkins administrator who has to update his Jenkins for the security release, I'm uh, delighted not to also have major features arriving in, in a plugin on the same day. Thank you. So weekend yeah. is great with me. Okay, then it's fine. Uh, I will release it, I think, uh, on the weekend. And then everybody can look at it. What I also changed is we have this uh, this chart here where we see the line coverage information. Um, this is already part of the last release. What we now also have, we can look at the same chart if we look only at the branch coverage. And what, yeah, we had this chart as well for the delta information, but for the delta information, it did not make much sense because we only have three or four files. So actually I removed it now but the information would be available if someone is interested. Yeah, and the, the nature of this chart is that it's showing me based on the size of the box, that's the number of files that are in it or the number no, of lines no, in no, it. The number of lines is currently used as metric. And then the then the, the coloring is used to hint what fraction of coverage is, yeah. is covered? Yes. For instance, here we have only 50, uh, five, uh, 58 percent and here we have uh, 83 and this is currently not customizable but in future releases we can add a customization that projects which have not so good coverage can reduce this information so green is maybe green if we have 80 percent for instance but this is not yet possible so one thing after the other so. And yeah, what's also not ready is uh, you can click here, but you can't see the source code now. What I want to do is uh, linking to the source code as well, so that if you click here, then you can see below the table the source code that eff effectively shows you which lines are covered and which not. That's, Just to that's... come back to the, the, the delta coverage, the change coverage, is it something that is available in the pull request as well? Um, yes, it will be available in the pull request as well. Uh, actually, I, I did not test it yet for pull requests, but uh, for pull requests, we have this so-called reference build. And, and the reference build is the build in the main branch where we have the information, the same information, and then we are comparing versus this reference build. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Maybe one thing uh, I would like to highlight here is, uh, or it's more a question. Well, I had a, a lot of problems to fill the screen to the yeah, entire screen area. And I'm not a JavaScript expert, but I think the problem is that we, our Jenkins layout is somehow strange because our uh, navigation here is part of the screen. So do you know why we, have this navigation not separated from the screen so that I can scroll the screen and the navigation will stay because currently we have just one page which scrolls the navigation and the screen which no other website is doing so typically the website you have here a, a separator let's say and then you can scroll the navigation separately from the content and I thought that was intentional because of, and, and it's it's legacy, certainly intentional 10 plus years ago, but it mm -hmm. was intentional because of the poverty of frame sets, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. so that the UI, I think Daniel Daniel's comment in the chat hints that frames frames have had a different set of usability problems we're actually looking at possibly injecting something like that onto Jenkins.io, www.jenkins.io as a way to help the navigation there for large pages. But it's mm -hmm. it's a complicated problem trying to get those left-hand sides, the sidebar stable to hold still while we move around on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. So just in case, it's possible to do that without frame, with just regular div and the scroll bar being for a specific area so that we ah. have the two separated. No, I think your example in the current page 
is a bit particular because we don't expect to have so many items on the left side. Usually it's between 10 and 20 maximum. In your case, I think you are close to 30. So it's also perhaps part of the issue there that it was yeah. not really expected at that point. And it depends a little bit if I'm uh, showing this thing on my uh, laptop screen or if I'm showing it on my monitor. And um, currently, I can say to the browser or to JavaScript, please fill the screen for this box here, for instance. But this box, the screen means uh, it go to here to the at the footer and that is not really the screen uh, i want to show on it use the place which is free for or visit which is visible so uh, th this would be something would be really helpful for ui design if we can have this navigation bar even typically if the navigation is too big it is going in an off screen uh, navigation where you can select or deselect it so maybe this would be something would be very helpful if we can add it in Jenkins. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Mm -hmm. No, just to, to fill the page, there are some ways, depending on what you are doing exactly, uh, potentially with a flex box, it could be sufficient. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps looking at the L, the L, I don't know in English, the, the size in vertical of the, the panel, it could be interesting perhaps if you are trying with uh, VH equal one, things like this, meaning it's equal to the full size that is available for the screen. There could be some ways to do like this. Not sure exactly what you are using at the moment, so can you tell more, I would say. And maybe an, another thing what uh, we implemented is now we have some uh, responsive design for the tables as well. That means uh, the content of the tables it changes uh, if your screen is going smaller. So if I go smaller, then yeah, okay, it's, then the, the package will disappear. So it depends. Uh, this is, I think, very helpful if you have only a laptop or you have your tablet, then you basically see only the file and the line coverage and the branch coverage and the rest is disappearing. And this is uh, something which is automatically provided by the data tables uh, I'm using here as a backend. So, so and and that res that definition of that response of which things should be removed that's part of the part of part of how you define this page. Yeah, I'm I'm using a Java model in the background, or this is an implementation from my data tables plugin, and this uh, in this. Uh, you define for each column a priority, it's an integer number. And for instance, the package has a very high integer number that it means you know, it's not really important. But if you have the place, use it. And you define these numbers, and then data tables will automatically uh, dis uh, hide these things which are not so interesting. This is quite or I'm using it quite often because on a laptop, I don't have so much space. And on my monitor, I have very much space where I would like to see everything if it's possible. Well, and I'm, I'm wondering if we need to use what you're doing in the Google Summer of Code project for automatic Git cache maintenance in terms of presenting its results because there may be lots of, there may be many things we want to show, some of them much less important than others. Uh, thank you. This is good to know that the capability is there. Good. Yeah, that's basically what I wanted to show. Any other questions on this topic? Okay. Thank None you. from me. Thanks, Uli. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back and share my screen. Let's mm -hmm. switch back to the agenda and you should see the agenda now. So next topic was Vadek, uh, two, two items related to security. Vadek, is there anything that you would like to share your screen with it? Or do you want me to just keep the notes up? How would you, how would you prefer? If you want to just open the pull request, that's fine. Uh, it's just a general situation that I have seen recently occurring more and more. It's some people that are not really integrated, included in the UX SIG meeting that are trying to do their own improvement on their side. 
And there is another parallel effort done by the SIG meeting uh, people that is overriding a bit the effort from the others. Not necessarily uh, it was the, the will to, to override the effort from the others, but it's more that for the contributor at the end, it's like, oh, thank you for your job, but we have doing something else in the meantime. So your code is no longer very valuable for us. That's this kind of thing that is a bit annoying to see there. I'm not saying it's something to someone to blame or things like that, not at all. It's really, is it something that we want to do or not? Like in this case, that person perhaps could be interested to join the SIG meeting, to discuss, to show his pull request, or have other people working with him instead of doing their own job on the other side. So that's more to open the discussion. No, uh, we don't have a lot of people in this meeting right now, so I'm not sure it's a good moment to discuss that, but just to highlight that fact. Thank you. So the, the concern here is in July of last year, this was submitted, but in the intervening period, there have been changes which made this either not, not helpful or no longer necessary. Or so do I remember correctly, Vadek? Do you, yeah, do you have totally. more history? No, that's that. You can look at the one of the last comments. It's mainly, yeah, in the meantime, we have done something that will make your pull request no longer valuable. So that's this kind of thing. Uh, we have seen that also with tooltip. Uh, someone proposed to have some tooltip using the direct the, the title or the tooltip inside an attribute. And that was mainly rewritten in a different pull request by using type P, uh, the GS, this kind of thing. It's more about to align the effort from the different people to prevent people, especially like that guy who are spending some time, but not a lot on his pull request at the end is overtaken by someone with more time or more expertise in the, in the, in the project. Thank you. So, so here, I think Alexander Brandes was suggesting, hey, it's, it's a bad pattern to have something, a relatively small change diff, diff content wise on, on unevaluated for a year and Basel notes then there are some additional challenges in this particular one, if it if it actually applies still or not. So there, there's certainly more to be done here. Good. And so I assume we may want to bring this topic again in future meetings, just as a reminder, or do we systematically want to look at pending pull requests on UI? Maybe we should be labeling the pull requests for UI and, and remind ourselves in this meeting, hey, which ones are, are pending review and we could use people looking at them? That could be a way, especially because the meeting is monthly. So if we are waiting at most one month before looking at that at least once, I think that's perfectly fine and a lot better than the current situation. Yeah, so I, I think now that means I've got to take some some initiative and and look at the pull requests and identify which ones which ones are UI and possibly tag them. But I think I think that would be a good thing to to add to this meeting agenda. Just I know it's it's turned really positive in the doc sig when we've done that. A little embarrassing in that we look at some really really old pull requests, but we're actually closing them by looking at them. So uh, good good idea. So let me. Let's try it, and next month I'll try to put that on the agenda. I will put it on the agenda, and we'll we'll test drive it to see if it works for us. Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, anything else on the the long or on? Let's see. There was a phrase that Basel used. It was long, long lived pull requests that uh, oh stalled. There you go. Anything else on stalled pull requests? Okay, next topic then, Vadek. So the next one is a bit uh, less happy, I will say. Uh, you have probably seen, we have released, especially thank you, Daniel, for that, uh, a new version, new security version today, as you mentioned, Mark, before. In that version, we are correcting five vulnerabilities that were recently introduced in Jenkins Core. I will say mainly, I'm not totally sure, but mainly related to the UI, at least four of them. And the issue there is mainly 
it's very rare in the past history of Jenkins that we have seen such, I will say, a newly introduced vulnerability. Most of the time, it's things that we are finding from the past. In this case, it was things that were recently added by accident, of course. But it's just the fact that it was a bit of change of uh, pace in terms of uh, introduction of some things. That was a bit annoying me to see. We had to work on that very quickly in urgency in some sense to prevent that to, to stay for long in the project. So that's a bit painful to see the effort that is needed to correct them after the pull request is merged compared to correcting that during the pull request. So for that, uh, I would like to block all the UI pull requests until they got an approval from the security team. The goal is not to block them forever, to not review them and just to block the process at all. It's not at all the goal. The goal is really that we got someone from security to review the pull request. I will assign people more resources in general from my team to work on that, to put the effort to review the different things, especially when they are close to be merged, I will say, so that we are reducing the likelihood to introduce new vulnerability. That's a bit the idea there. And uh, I wanted to discuss that with you. What do you think? Is it something that you think would be too annoying? What could be the counterpart? So, any thought about that aspect? So, to me, so long as security team members are assigned uh, and have the capacity to do it, I think it's great. The danger, the the danger that worries me about those is about that is if they don't have time to do it then it's just a block on the pull request without any without any progress but if you're assigning people i think that's that's significant positive because that means more people are reviewing the pull requests in general not just for for security so i i think yeah. that's great that's really the goal if at some point we are no longer able to provide the resources it's mainly go with us in a sense i don't want to block the, the improvements, the different UI revamp if, uh, evolution in Jenkins are very nice, very great for the community. It's really not the goal to, to kill this kind of effort. It's just to be there to prevent the vulnerability to be introduced at that point. And most of the time, it's because of a single line that is not uh, written in the correct way, this kind of thing. So it's really a quick correction in the pull request. But if we have to do a full security release for that, it's just a ton of work that we have to do instead of the client change. Right. Well, I, so I think you just highlighted it's much better for us to detect and correct a security risk before the merge and before a release in Jenkins core. Yep, exactly. The side effect, interestingly, there is that we will have more people, as, as you said, on the pull request to review the stuff because I don't expect the security people who are doing the review to just look at the code. I expect them to play with the pull request, to try with payload everywhere, like you can imagine with security people, with XSS payload everywhere in the screen to see if something is triggered. So it's also a way to see if there are some regression and things like that. No, it's not the goal to look at quality only, but it's just a potential side effect. That makes sense to me. Any any concerns from others or any insights that others want to share? I think if we have the resources, it is really good. But uh, currently we have a lot of uh, UI changes. So maybe this is also the problem that we have so many bugs uh, because we have a lot of new things which appear. And uh, the last 10 years, uh, actually nothing happened on Jenkins UI, so I don't think you know this is a problem this is just a lot of changes cause a lot of problems that is uh, i think a normal thing and yeah totally if you are doing nothing you will not introduce this yeah. so it's expected so yeah i hope to uh, to have at least one person reviewing the pull request fairly mm -hmm. soon on this kind of thing so yeah uh concerning yeah, that there is no yeah go on, sorry. It's fine. If we ah, okay, have perfect. Resource, that's fine. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, if there is no objection, this kind of thing, I will send an, um, not an email, but a, a message in the group for the, the developer of Jenkins to mention that new policy, in a sense, uh, with the blockage of the different pull requests related to the UI. 
So the point you mentioned, Mark, before concerning the label, the tag about the UI will be more important as well. And also, I think Basil created a label especially for uh, security review, something like this. It could be also used for this kind of thing to help us knowing which one the UI people would like to get a review, because I don't want to review a pull request that is expected to take, I don't know, three months to be completed. The review needs to be done, of course, as soon as possible, but if we are constrained in terms of resources, I prefer to do that close to the end instead of doing that multiple times during the, the work in progress phase. And of course, it will be revised over time if we are seeing a huge progress in terms of quality, like if we are not able to correct anything because there is nothing wrong in terms of security, we will reduce this kind of requirement of policy in the mid long term potential. The sooner the better, I would say, from my point of view, to prevent resources to be spent there, but that's really for the, the ills of the project. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and another question from me. Um, these uh, new uh, yeah, problems we, uh, which have appeared, uh, do we have some, uh, or is it possible to use some static checkers that find those security problems, or is it just someone needs to look at it? I will say thank you very much for the question, but at the same time, not thank you. Uh, it's a problem in Jenkins in the sense that we are not using regular view templating. With Jelly, it's particular. So okay. we are not able to find this kind of thing very quickly. We are able to have some custom rules in uh, CodeQL, for example, for regular Java code to find, oh, you are lacking this kind of annotation, you are lacking this kind of thing. But for Jelly, it's a lot more complicated. Especially these XSS that we have found recently were, I will say, complicated to find just by looking at the code. It's a matter of things that are not escaped or escaped, but then unescaped by some JavaScript that is then parsed and uh, executed. So it's really a multiple step effort to have the vulnerability really impacting the project. So. That's a very good question. We are asking the question ourselves, what we could do to prevent this kind of thing to be introduced. And I'm getting the question also from a lot of other people you can imagine. At the moment, we do not have a, a good solution. It's something that we can work on trying to find a way, especially with CodeQL. There are ways to parse a bit more the XML, JV, this kind of thing, but that will also require some additional logic to cover the pure JavaScript part that is more complicated to analyze statically. So some Maybe of them it. could probably be taken care of by having content security policy, but that's a big project. So it doesn't help us in the next year or so. Okay. But would it, well, I think it would be at least helpful if these five uh, problems we have would be uh, clarified a little bit on the mailing list, for example, that other developers would see what actually was a problem. Currently, I, I only see uh, we have some vulnerabilities, then I upgrade my Jenkins and everything is fine. But what for me as a developer would help if I see what actually was the problem, what should I avoid in my code? So I'm not sure if we can extract this information at least a little bit for the developers. Don't do this and don't do that so in this kind of style. Maybe that would be helpful as well. We have test cases. So if you're looking, if you're trying to understand a specific vulnerability that we addressed, uh, you can look at the test case, uh, testing that it is actually fixed. And that should give you an idea of what not to do. Um, some some of them are kind of artificial necessarily uh, because Jenkins is a framework for plugins in a way. And uh, so it's not immediately visible in all cases how this would be done. But one example is don't build an HTML string that includes user input without properly escaping that user input. So that's really cross-site scripting 101 right there.
And just to do some advertisement as well for CSP, so content security policy, it's a project that I would like to put more effort in. Waiting perhaps for Oktoberfest again, it's easier to have other contribution there, but that could be really a way to prevent this kind of excesses classes in general. That could be nice, but as Daniel said, it's a long, long project. We need to have better ways to do uh, security before, I would say. Any other question? So looking forward for the accessibility topic. Okay, so this one is, is just a, a reminder that at our last session or at a previous session, I noted that a company had contacted me saying, hey, we've done a Jenkins ex user interface accessibility assessment it's German language, we'd like to contribute it to the community. What's the most effective way to contribute it to the community? And, and my thought was, should we, or my questions were things like, shall we, one, get it translated from German language to something I can read as in English? And then two, do we create in, a, an epic in JIRA that describes these things with individual topics or do we just create the epic and wait for for people who have capacity? You know, is it is it premature to create a bunch of issues in Jira for accessibility improvements? Rather, would it be better to think about accessibility in some different way, prioritize differently, et cetera? This is where I'm I'm looking for input from others on what's what's most effective in terms of how we interact with these observations about accessibility that have been made by somebody as part of their a company evaluation of Jenkins. Perhaps do you have an estimation of the number of tasks that you would like to create? Like, is it just five or six or more than 200? Oh, I would guess it's on the order of hundreds. I haven't looked okay. at the report specifically, but considering what these, these kinds of assessments usually detect, it, it, I would expect it to be on the order of hundreds, probably not thousands, but hundreds I could easily see where, hey, missing tab navigation for this, or doesn't have screen reader support for that, or lacks a keyboard shortcut here that could help the user in this way, those kinds of things. And, and they, they're quite frequent. My recommendation will be to mainly get some task more as a spike to analyze the report and to categorize a bit the issue. Because for example, if something is related to the missing alt text for icon, it's something that could be done at once in the jelly tag directly. But if it's about the tab navigation that will require revamp of different pages, that's something that needs to be uh, group together as a category in a sub epic this kind of thing that could ease a bit the, the work there ah good point okay so so maybe outline it as stepwise saying hey first step is we need to review and assess and yeah. as part of that review and assessment that probably involves a a grouping and a prioritization and possibly a partitioning of here's here are various classes of of interesting things that this report gave. Yeah, okay. Review, prioritize, summarize the areas, areas, impacted areas. Um, Perhaps and then, if you, yeah, let's go into it. Sorry, go ahead, Badek. Perhaps if you have the opportunity to discuss the topic with Christina, it could be interesting because she has some um, accessibility sensibility, I would say. So she was really interested in the topic. So potentially she could help also in terms of uh, prioritization, categorization, this kind of thing. Yeah, and Christina's attended these sessions previously. So that's, that's a, a good idea. Excellent, okay, good. Any other observations or recommendations there? My specific request to the, to the submitters was, I don't want to treat their, their work with disrespect in the sense of putting it into something that then we don't get the benefit out of it. And I like the idea of 
review, prioritize, and summarize because that's giving us real value. Great, thank you. I think it would be really helpful to see this report somewhere publicly. So, so I can read it, for instance, because I'm interested in UI things. So I think we had such a, a report about usability a couple of years ago. It was also in German. And, and it was really helpful for me to read it to see uh, what I'm doing wrong in my plugins. So I think it will help people if they have the time and the interest. And it's better than have it just in a box and nobody looks into it. So attach it to a Jira and then everybody who is interested can look at it in the first. Agreed. And I think I think that's a that's already a good first step. Just attaching it and using that Jira as an epic gives us the source document. And the source document for those who are already comfortable in German language is already good enough, right? That's already a great start. And, and those of us who are not comfortable in German language can always apply Google Translate and get it get some help with Google Translate to generate it in, in other forms. All right, so let me put the action item on, on me. And I'll double check that I've actually got the source document. Thanks, everybody. All right, and since Jan had not joined us, I'd propose that we delay the UI improvements topic until another time. Any other topics that need to be discussed in UX SIG today? All right, thanks, everyone. Uh, recording will be available in probably 24 hours or less, and we'll post it. Oh, oh, Daniel asked if it's Deutsche Telekom. I don't think so, but I don't know who it was. So I will certainly look up that document. And Daniel, I think I'm going to put a link to that document into these notes. Thanks very much, because that way I've got a reference to a past historical document. See previous from Deutsche, Deutsche, Deutsche Telekom. Excellent, thank you. Thanks very much. Any other topics for today? All right, recording will be posted in roughly 24 hours. Thanks again, everyone for joining.